Thank you. So tonight I stand in front of you, a volunteer and a uh, psychology buff. And my goal is to bridge the gap between your unconscious mind and your decision making whether or not to be a volunteer in your community. Now I've been a volunteer for about two and a half years now, as she mentioned, with the Boy Scouts of America. And um, I can say confidently at the end of the day, the strength of our programming is directly associated with the quality of our volunteer base. It's probably nothing more important to our organization. And we're not alone. I know a lot of nonprofit organizations feel the same way. We're all looking for that next rock star volunteer, which are becoming harder to find. To throw a statistic at you, 2013 was the lowest rate of volunteerism in America since they started measuring it at the Department of Labor Statistics. Um, it's that alarming trend that I wanted to peek into with my psychology hat on. So I went back to the textbooks and I actually pulled out these four wonky psychology terms. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to memorize them um, because I'm going to actually walk you through um, a storyline. Four individuals who are currently neighbors, a fictional story. Four neighbors who don't actually know each other yet, but through their efforts, they're going to run into each other. They're going to become aware of these barriers to civic engagement and make individual, small, manageable contributions to a community park that they share. It's been neglected for years, doesn't, doesn't look so hot. But by the end of the TED Talk, through their efforts, we'll see a much more beautiful park and something the neighborhood really stands behind. Before we get into that story, though, I want to explain where these barriers come from. It's, it's important to understand um, how they develop. So in my class, I like to say that the brain is lazy, but uh, I usually do that to wake everybody up. So the truth is, um, your brain's hyper-efficient, and it has to be. Your brain's constantly processing information. Even right now, you've got hundreds of messages coming in. You've got sensory messages from your butt telling you, hey, we're, we're seated, everything's good down here. Uh, you've got life support systems, respiration, digestion, heart rate, thankfully. And you also have to pay conscious attention to what I'm saying, I hope. I've been practicing for, for, for weeks now, so. Um, <laughs> So you have to ignore the phone buzzing in your pocket, somebody's fidgeting with a candy wrapper, and pay attention. The only way you're able to do this is by leveraging some of the shortcuts your brain develops. So these shortcuts have, are helpful. Your brain's taking in information and says, okay, in this situation, we should behave this way. And you think about it as boxes, and I, I think that box goes in the attic of your memory. The next time you need to behave in a certain way, you go to the box, you take it out, and you use it again. So it's only, well, let me give you an example. You drive up to a stop sign. You don't have to actually think about pressing the brake, right? It's become an automatic behavior, which is good because you might be deep in conversation or singing along to Taylor Swift's new album. I, that could happen. It could happen. <laughs> so, but these shortcuts can get out of control, and we can go back to those boxes too automatically. And if that happens, we can we start to see barriers. So let's start with the first one. In the lab, we can develop in, in this poor animal <laughs> learned helplessness. The fluoride's got a mild electric shock. And over the course of the study, we, we kind of sap the animal of its initiative to behave differently to improve its environment. And we know this because if we open up the, the hatch in the center there, the dog will, instead of jump to the other side, will stay where it is in the uncomfortable situation. It's kind of alarming that it won't behave differently to take advantage of an opportunity. So you're saying, well, what does that have to do with people? Well, if you think about that dog as a person, and this story begins with Jesse, and you replace that box with the, the community Jesse just moved to. So he's a, he's a transplant. He moved to this small town, middle America. And uh, upon getting comfortable and meeting some of the people, he recognized that some of the people here are pessimistic. There's kind of a ethos of... Um, Messaging like, remember how great this city was? Or, you know, Jesse, that's a good idea, but we tried that a couple years ago. It's not going to work. So he, he's recognizing that this community sort of has this learned helplessness attitude. And as a transplant, I think he's willing to go and contribute something manageable and based on his resources. He's going to go to the park, become a role model for, for minor change. He fixes the fence and mows the grass. Pretty modest for a young man. You know, he doesn't have a lot of resources. 
and there's his contribution. Like I said, it's a modest upgrade, just enough to have the neighborhood start to take notice. They're turning their heads. They're starting to talk about, oh, see that young man that just moved in the neighborhood? Seemed to independently take some initiative. And there's a lot of work to be done still, but Jesse became a role model for another person in that community. Somebody who um, wasn't, didn't have a whole lot of faith in themselves to bring about change. That brings me to the second barrier, what's called locus of control. Again, a psychology term, but you can picture it as a spectrum. Everybody in here places yourself, automatically you evaluate yourself on whether or not you can affect change and bring positivity into your environment. And at one end you have external. That's kind of where Susie exists. That's people that kind of embody learned helplessness, don't believe that um, circumstances are within their control. So she was there until she witnessed Jesse working in the park, a young man just rolling his sleeves up. And she took that as a little bit of initiative to move herself towards the internal locus of control, where a lot of volunteers exist, um, leaders, and generally more happy people. Her contribution is to take on that shed, needs some, needs some work, and that probably needs a few other people to help out. So she ropes in a couple of friends, they go to the um, local hardware store, buy a hinge, some paint for that shed, and a new window pane. Looks like what their contribution is. Not bad, right? There's still one pretty big glaring issue, though. You know, I don't, I don't care where you're from, the word chaos, not the most inviting message for a community park, right? So we have to do something about that. In the past, the third barrier to um, involvement, community engagement, is what we call uh, functional fixedness. In the past, the community was trying to, the landlord had to paint over that chaos and then two weeks later, there'd be another graffiti tag, and it was kind of cyclical. It really wasn't a solution at all. I told you already that the brain takes in information, kind of puts behaviors and um, problem-solving solutions into boxes. When we, when we go back to these boxes too often, we end up here, right? Anybody recognize that situation? We've, it's all normal stuff. This happens to everybody. It's actually, um, it's actually a, a good thing to be able to remember. But this guy, Brad, has to get out of the box. His new attitude, his new approach to the graffiti is to actually find the artist through some people he knows, brings him, bring him or her to the table with uh, community organizers, law enforcement, and bring about an image that the neighborhood can get behind, something that will really finish off this park. Let's take a look. Birds. Everyone likes birds. And yes, it is convenient that the tree is blossoming at the same time. I mentioned I work in marketing, but <laughs> it's strictly coincidence. So this park is working. It's connecting people. They're now coming in and playing frisbee, walking the dog, eating lunch, and, and, and introducing themselves to each other and talking about what, what great activities are taking place here, the progress. And that sense of shared responsibility can be rare because of the fourth barrier. And that's called the bystander effect. And the bystander effect, essentially people who live in groups, which is virtually everybody, we all make the assumption that somebody else will take, um, take responsibility for problems, right? And the bigger the group is, the more diffuse that responsibility becomes to the point where maybe nobody is doing anything about it. Um, we've, we've done it before. Walk over a piece of litter, drive by somebody with mechanical issues on the road, or in some extreme cases, people don't report um, criminal activity. People that witness a crime, nobody calls. So. In the storyline, this gentleman, Luke, was walking down the street, witnessed a altercation. Didn't do anything about it. You know, kind of like saw it happen, kept on walking, and got home and sort of had that epiphany moment where, geez, you know, probably I should have stepped in or somebody should have stepped in. It's, you know, I, I'm surprised nobody did anything about it. So he needs to overcome that the next chance he gets. He feels a little bit guilty, wants to not fall victim to the bystander effect again. So his, what he's going to contribute to this park, after seeing some, some incremental improvements, is to apply something he's passionate about. He's got a green thumb, likes gardening. So he's going to replant the garden, and this is his contribution. A little cherry on top. So the park's basically finished. It's gorgeous. And it's also a metaphor for group success. You know, this could be 
a habitat for humanity. It could be the stock shelves of a food bank. It could be um, you know, the winning pizza party after the winning championship game of youth soccer. Whatever it is, the point is it took individuals rolling their sleeves up and taking some initiative and recognizing their own potential. So as you leave here today, remain motivated. This, the energy in here is very electric. Everyone's feeling really good. So it's not that hard to leave and be motivated. But tomorrow morning, when you wake up, that's, that's the catch. Remain motivated to do a couple of things. Recognize that you may, be, you may need to be the positive voice for change. You may, may, you may need to believe in your own potential. Um, think outside the box if you have to. Invite other people to help you. Um, and lastly, roll your sleeves up. Take initiative. After you do that, hit the internet or call the United Way or see me after this or sign up on the blue wall out there and get involved with something that you can be passionate about, like the guy with the green thumb. Next, set manageable goals. Once you're signed up, um, don't overextend yourself. It's important to take those manageable goals, like the four people in the park. You don't want this to feel like your work. If you do that, you'll be surrounding yourself with like-minded people, and that synergy will allow you and your community to find your tipping point. Thank you.